Um, maybe we should just start with introducing ourselves to everybody who's here. Um, so uh, do you guys want to go first? Lisa, you've been kind of yes. quiet. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm Lisa Lax, and I have an agency in Memphis. That was where I started in 2008. And then I expanded to New York and then on to Nashville. And I started out as an actor years ago, like a lot of you on the that are watching. And I feel like that's really contributed to me as an agent. I can kind of see your side of things and help with you, you in uh, areas sometimes maybe that you know, if you you know, weren't kind of an actor before, you might not understand. And uh, I think that's really contributed to, to who I am in my agency. Terrence? Oh, Terrence Heard, the Heard Agency. As I said earlier, I incorporated in 1995, so I've been around here a long time. Uh, celebrated the 27th annual Heard Agency Fashion Show last night. Um, I, a native of Chicago, as I said earlier, uh, came here to, to attend the this school in Nashville, the Fisk University, uh, open January 9th, 1866. And then I also did my master's at Fisk. And while at Fisk, I created the Fisk Homecoming Fashion Show, which is still a tradition at Fisk now. And I started producing fashion shows, uh, started modeling at Three, I think my grandmother had in my first fashion show at like three, you know, and so um, did a pursuit of masters or finished a masters in clinical psychology. Thought I wanted to be a psychologist, and now I just counsel neurotic models. <laughs> it comes in handy sometimes, you know, and you know, but so yeah, that's the herd agency. I book film, television, commercials, and have been doing it for a long time. You're in that and based here in Nashville. I bet that psychology degree does help. Um, there's a, a lot of emotion in this world. Um, hey, I'm Melinda. I am the directing agent at the Avenue Agency. We have an office in Atlanta. We also have an office in Nashville. We work throughout the entire Southeast region. Uh, we are union franchised, full service. Um, our actors range from three years old up to 87, I think is our oldest. Um, so that's who we are. Um, and I don't know if you guys have anything specific you want to touch on, but I'm always curious, what questions do you hear from actors that, that seem like myths that we can dispel? That's one of my favorite things to do when I'm talking with actors is help redirect the course because there's a lot of misunderstandings, especially when they are out working with they're coaches who are not working actively in the market, but are helping them with their creative world. Um, you know, when they're working with other actors around them, they sometimes uh, start conversations and things can end up going in different directions. Um, actually, before we talk about myths, I see that we have been joined. Um, would, you, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? You're on mute. Oh, you're muted. You're on mute. Can you unmute your mic? There I am. <laughs> there you are. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Janelle with Talent Track. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Good to see you. Parents. Hi, Janelle. We've never met, but we we spoken on the phone a few times. Many times, yes. yes. Nice to meet you. <laughs> too. My um sorry, my uh, I just got here. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry I joined late, everybody. My apologies. Nice you're here. Yes, thank you. No worries, Janelle. Do you want to introduce yourself and uh, and the agency to all the people listening? Okay, uh, I'm Janelle Walker. I'm with Talent Trek Agency. Um, geez, we've been no, you're not a long time. <laughs> um, I we started in '84 um, in Knoxville. Uh, opened an office there. Um, then in about, I don't know, 10 years, opened an office in Nashville in 94. And then after that, opened one in Asheville, North Carolina and Chattanooga, um, Tennessee. So uh, that's kind of our, um, where we are. Our two offices in Asheville and Chattanooga are kind of satellite offices. Um, we tried to fully staff them to begin with, but the markets when we originally started wasn't really ready uh, for that. It um, didn't pay for 
the staff we had there. So uh, they're kind of satellite offices now, but those markets are growing and has been growing. So um, that might change. But of course, the one in Nashville is staffed with Robin and Evelyn. And um, next year will be we're thinking about adding a third person. So um, that's kind of us in a nutshell. Just been here a really long time. So I appreciate it, everybody. Great. So we were just getting ready to talk about um, myths and things that we hear actors tell us and how we're um, inside the industry on a daily basis, but how conversations can develop amongst actors and people who are not working in the industry on a daily basis and um, how we can help the actors kind of redirect some of those uh, misunderstandings or just lack of information, which um, you know, is totally okay. And I wanna say for the actors, you know, you guys are out there in the trenches and you're doing this hard work of acting um, and, and you are focused on the creative and the emotional and it's not your job to be inside the industry and, and you're not sitting there, right? Like you're focused on what's happening around you creatively, whereas your agents are sitting in a chair where literally we see the industry growing and changing and developing around us every day. We see you guys growing and changing and developing and we're kind of helping shift the path that you're on to meet what is happening within the industry um, as it happens gradually. And so that means sometimes the actors can get this uh, information through other sources, other actors, uh, coaches, what have you, that is maybe outdated information and isn't really gonna help you uh, in the current market. So um, what questions do you guys see actors asking you that you have the opportunity to, to redirect them on and get them back on the right path? Terrence, can we start with you? Oh, you're, 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 I guess the biggest myth is that every commercial you, you're going to get residuals every time it runs. I mean, I, I, actors come to me with that all the time. Like, that is not how it works, you know. Right? I'm going to check every time they run it. I was like, no, that is not how it works. That's the union commercial. It's, it's a billing cycle. It's not every time a commercial runs is within that cycle. So I haven't explained that to talent, thinking that every time they book a commercial, new talent, they've heard that every commercial, every time it runs, it, they get a check. I was like, no, 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 that's just not how it works. You know, so that's a myth I, I'm often shooting down for with the new talent. I'm not, anybody yeah. else experienced that? <laughs> Yeah, and your and the terms are always there for for the actor to look at, so you can see what you're agreeing to before you agree to it. Um, and those those are the terms once you've agreed to it, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. But they've always heard oh. that though to be the case, and when they come in, I'm like, no, that's not the case. <laughs> I'm curious, yeah. if, like with the chat, do we have anyone um, that made a comment about this about a myth that? they want to know it you know about any of the actors participants i don't see anything in the chat not yet not yet, not yet. okay okay great any questions and answers for the end of the program another myth that i i find challenging is that um and and this might be coming from an african-american perspective too you know everybody likes to be you know with their counterparts so all the little blonde girls want to go walk over to the agency where all the little blonde friends are and i just think that's the dumbest thing on the planet if there's 30 people who look just like you, you, you you're not needed at that agency you know and i try to explain that to people like you go where people look just like you and now all of you are in competition with one another you know, exactly. now you all are fighting for the audition with one another. If they got 30 little blonde 20 year olds on the roster, you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be the 31st, you know? So that myth that we all, you know, I, I don't want every African-American actor with my agency. No, I, I gotta, you know, I want certain looks to cover different looks. I don't want the same look consistently, but I think um, a lot of people think that they need to be, especially the high school girls, they want to be where their friends are. And I'm like, well, you know, your friend's already there. Now she's your enemy. She's actually your competition within that agency. You know, you know. So I think that's a problem uh, that I like to address also. I think one of the things that I have um, like a problem with that a lot of actors sort of have this myth, and I, a lot of times I don't know how to help them with it, is once they book 
okay, they book something really big right out of the gate, right? First thing. So they think they cannot go on anything, you know, less than that, or they're, and they're going to continue that and that they should be like now, because they had this one big job. Now they should be a star, a star. Yeah. I, I was trying to refrain from saying that. Yeah. Exactly. And I have this problem with help helping them through that process. Yeah. 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 I love to tell people, I love it when actors ask me positive questions and in interviews. So um, when I get the question, how can I, how can I help you? What can I do that is helpful to you as an agent? And one of the things that I say, or, or a better question maybe is what do you see your successful actors doing? And on that note, Lisa, I almost always say, they say, yes, they're looking for opportunities to practice, whether it's an audition or work or whatever. And I'm not saying you have to say yes to everything, but the actors who are successful generally say yes more often. And I think yeah. that's what makes them successful is they have the ability to build that spider web of relationships because everyone is connected to everyone else in production and casting. Um, and then they get more opportunities because they're saying yes. Well, what I tell people is to be an actor requires you to be acting. So if your last job was two years ago, that was the last time you were an actor two years ago. You're not, you know, so I, that's how I put it. To be an actor, you got to be acting. So if it's years between your jobs, you're not an actor. You should be working all the time. You know, you need to be working. And to Lisa's point, uh, I had the worst case of that was years ago, the movie uh, The Last Castle, the Robert Redford movie. And I had an actor. He just got out of the military. He was 28 years old. He's been 10 years in the military. And he uh, did a Cobra commercial. And his second audition was The Last Castle with Robert Redford, James Gandolfini, and all these guys. And he gets a, a scene in there where he, uh, you know, he sings a little cadence and he shoots a guy. But I, and he thought, a, for him, a star was born. And I was like, no, no, no. It's a military prison movie, and you played a soldier. You got out of the military nine months ago. I mean, playing a soldier when you got out of the military nine months ago is not what we call acting. You know, it's just, it's playing to type. And so all of a sudden, and I think he's, uh, that was in whatever that movie was in late, early 2000s, late 90s, but, uh, but he made like 25 grand on the movie. And the next thing I know, what does it pay? Oh, it's this a thousand dollars a day. Oh, I can't do that. I'm like, what? <laughs> to the least's point, it, it was almost impossible to get him to do anything else because now he yeah. made his second audition. He made twenty five grand, and now he don't want to work anything less than that. And I'm like, and you have never taken an acting class. You can't even act. You fired a gun in a movie, and you have been in the military for ten years. That's not what we call acting, you know. So. Yeah, that was a really hard one. I wanted to have him to drop him also because he just would not do anything else. Mm. He wanted the next job to pay 25 grand or more. Yeah. I want the next job to pay 25 grand or more too. Yeah. Me too. I want every job to pay 25 grand or more, right? <laughs> when they get that, now. or when they get that first major job like that, it's either they won't take the lesser paying job or I'm moving to LA. That's the, yeah, that's the other the one. Yeah, that's one. <laughs> you know, Janelle, that's a great, that's a that's great a thing to bring one. up. Like, that's when do you move to LA? I mean, I think right now, LA is not the heavy hitter. No. Um, <laughs> you're, no, you want to you move are, LA for sure. Uh, it used yeah. to be, but still, you know, you think about it, that's kind of where they think they're going to make their mark is LA regardless of the time, whether it's, you know, years ago or now, that's where actors think, you know, it has to be. And now we've got that great comeback of, no, you don't have to be in LA now because, you know, the Southeast is where it's at, you know, and we're doing so much, so many more movies here mm -hmm. and so many more projects here than LA is doing. So if you can make that point across to them, it's a lot better, but, you know, then again, they've got to have the credits to go. You know, I have to tell every, all of my actors when they say, that, oh, I could do that and I want to go to Atlanta and I want to, you know, audition for this, you know, Spider-Man or whatever it is. I said, well, let's take a look at your credits because you're not only up against people here 
in this market, you're up against people in Atlanta that have tons of credits. You're up against people in Nashville that have tons of credits. And I mean, let's be realistic. Casting directors are not going to ask people with two credits, you know, to audition well, that got, you know, 1500 that have major credits on there. So you have to build your resume, whether that's with independent films, you know, things that you can, theater, anything you can do to make that resume thicker. You got to do it because, um, I mean, I hate, I hate it, but that's the way it is. You think of all of us whenever we're submitting. How many actors do you submit on one row? You know, you got 10, 20, maybe 30. I don't know. But and multiply that by 100 agents. That's what the casting directors have to look through. Where do you think they're going to go? They're going to go to, you know, people they know that have a major have had major roles and they're going to go to people with lots of credits and or videos that they can watch. Yeah. So, yeah. so mm -hmm. you know, when you have to narrow that down to what 30 actors for the director to see, because they're not going to send them 300 videos per role, they're going to narrow that down. And how does that happen? It's in our own lives, that in our own offices. How do we narrow that down? Same way with casting directors. So actors have to realize that, you know, that experience counts and they have to do the work to get to that level. So, um, I mean, that's what I tell my actors. They've got to, you know, do the work. It's, it's not incumbent upon agents to do that for them. It's incumbent on them. And they have to do it, not us. I mean, it's just. And there's so much opportunity for them now. There's so much. Yes. So they <laughs> should be building the resumes. Yes. yes. Low budget films, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, the, you know, my actors will, you know, let me tell me, you know, well, I'd like to be uh, submitted for this, that, and the other, whatever. And the ones that are really serious about building their credits are the ones who will email me and say, hey, I'd like to be submitted for this low budget thing. You know, every low budget thing they can find and whether it, whether they break even or, you know, sometimes not because they want a chance at that role. And those low budget roles are the ones that are going to get chances out if they don't have a lot of experience. But sometimes that has backfired for me. I have an a, a actor who is landed every low budget film because he's a good looking guy and he's landed every low budget film out there he uh i mean he left the show last night he didn't spend the night because he had one this morning okay and so he's always doing these low budget films and he thinks he's a better actor than he is he's not studying because he's every low budget he submits for he gets i said i said I, you know but you know your competition is probably a person who's a you know, you're a D-list actor. That probably that person's an a, a F-list. They're not even on a list, okay? <laughs> you know, they, you know, and so you know, so they're not even on a list. That's who you're beating out for the role. You need to move up to. You try to beat out the least the C-list actors. You know, and that's who you need to be competing against. Not these people who've never done anything before. That's who you're beating out on these low-budget uh, photo uh, movies. But he's getting them all the time, and I can't convince him that he needs acting classes because he's not a strong actor, you right. know. But he's booking a, a, a independent because he's willing to drive. He lives in Alabama, so he's in Atlanta today. He was in Nashville yesterday. He's willing to to drive because he, he has the money. His schedule allows him to drive, so he's all over the place doing them, and he's doing at least one a week. But I but he's working. He's, he's working. working, but. Oh. And, you know, maybe that's and, what he wants to do. You know, maybe well, that's no, what no, he wants, he wants to, to move up, but he's getting auditions for major parts because his demo reel looks good, but he's not landed any one of them. He's not landed the speaker because he's not a strong actor, and yeah. I, I can't convince him to take acting classes because he's working all the time. <laughs> you know, you're trying, and if he doesn't see, realize that he's not getting the roles, he's exactly. you know, yeah, auditioning. That's a really go ahead, Janelle. Sorry. <laughs> Well, I was going to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, you're trying. And if he's not landing those roles, those major roles that he's auditioning for, if that don't dong in his head, I mean, you know. It's, uh, the ding, the, the light bulb has to go off. You're, exactly. you're getting all these uh, independent roles. When I'm giving you like one-liners in a, 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 a major project, you're not booking those. 
Guys, you're not. A, you gotta take some acting classes. And, and and I'm happy. I love the fact when he came to me with his resume and all this. I was excited. Oh, this guy has been working. He is doing the homework, but he's not taking acting classes. He's just really good looking with a good body, and he's getting all these independent roles because people are look. You know, because he's good looking, basically. That's Lisa, really what were you going to say? I think it's important. Everyone has to realize they have to do both. They have exactly. to train constantly. And this is a really, you know, my serious actors, they may be guest starring and recurring, but they're still training. Mm -hmm. This is something I can't get into. A lot of people like are lower on the totem pole. You know, I can't get into their head that this is what they do. They're still training. They're still working. They change coaches. They work with different people. It's a constant thing that they're doing ongoing. So they need to be working and training just because they're working. Doesn't mean they're not training. There's always another skill you can work on, right? Sure. Always mm -hmm. something else. Um, can Lisa, can I piggyback on that? Um, yeah. I think, I agree that every actor is different. And so sometimes I think when actors are all listening to us, the ones who are working with coaches hear, oh, I've got to stay in coaching. And then they get more coaching and then they become overwhelmed because they're doing so much coaching that either they become stale as actors, they're not interesting anymore, or they just can't get around to the, I have had actors actually say, I can't get that audition done in time because I have acting class. And I'm like, whoa, cart before the horse. Um, what are you doing? So, um, you know, I think there, there has to be a balance. So, you know, um, yes, you've absolutely got to work. And so the guy that is working with Terrence that isn't, isn't in any coaching sessions is shooting himself in the foot because he's not growing his skill set, right? That's an important part of your job. Sure. Um, but also taking breaks from coaching, if you are one of those people that is constantly in a workshop session of some sort, get out, get out it's and take a break. If you haven't, if you've been continuously in coaching for, you know, three, four, six months, it's time for you to take a break because your mind needs time to relax and to process everything that you've learned in those prior months. And you've also got to work on yourself as a person, right? Like the things that make actors interesting are the depth that you have to offer. And if you've only been going to coaching classes and if you've only been um, auditioning and <clears throat> working on your craft, you're probably not a very interesting person anymore because that, that makes you singular, right? So go out and develop hobbies and, um, you know, do you want to be in westerns well then go learn how to ride a horse or whatever else you are interested in you can you can create your hobbies around the roles that you're reading for right um but but develop yourself as a person develop yourself as an actor and give yourself space to let your brain process and practice what you are learning rather than trying to to keep going all the time i think that go 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 mentality that some actors get creates a level of anxiety that makes it difficult for them to find their true space when they do really get the right audition for themselves. So balance. You have to use the time also for life experiences because you know that's how you learn. If you watch other people, you know those life experiences that you can gain from giving yourself time. That's more, that's way important. For sure. Uh, Melinda, the missing a uh, 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 self tape uh, because of acting class. My guy has missed three self taping roles for because he's on a set of an independent project. So, <laughs> I was like, you, you're missing a major project because you're making a hundred bucks a day, dude. Stop that. You know. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Too bad he's not listening today. He's probably on on an independent set. He, he literally um. is. He left. He, <laughs> <laughs> left last night to get to the set this morning. I was like, <laughs> so hey guys, Diana asked a question in the chat. Um, she says, I've been coached by multiple sources to write a detailed intro pitch letter when submitting to agencies. How do you feel about that? Um, I'm going to leave it at that because I have seen these. I don't spend a lot of time in our new faces at somebody else, but um, I have seen these pitch letters and they are, I'm just going to be honest, they're awful. They're terrible. Um, they are long and ridiculous and laborious. And 
maybe you guys love them. And if you do, I am down for anybody that has a different opinion, but I personally detest them. I don't think they have any value. If you want to submit, submit your materials, submit a couple of sentences because we're busy people and we're not going to read your dissertation and Pitch tell us who to, you are. To us as a and casting leave it at that. Say again. Pitch that is to us or to a casting director. To They're us. coming to us. Mm-hmm. as the agents yeah well, I forget those. <laughs> and there's a there's a formula to it too because I get the mm-hmm. same exact one exactly. from like a lot of people there is a specific coach that is teaching people how to do this and I personally am not a fan <laughs> no, I, I, don't want to let, I want to talk to a talent and, and and talk to them and get to know them I don't want a letter I, I'd rather you call instead of an interview so I can get to know who you are I don't really I'm, I'm not going to read a letter I can tell you that now <laughs> Lisa I totally agree. I get these all the time. They're very long. And then you have to click on a link to then get to a headshot. And then that doesn't open because it's on Google or something. And there's some issue there. It's ridiculous. I hate them. I don't know who's doing them. They started, I would say, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's just been ongoing. The first thing I want to see is a headshot in there. I mm-hmm. want to see a great headshot. And if I got to click on 10 different things to look at a headshot, I'm not going to do it. We don't have time. So mm-hmm. I like the headshot, the real, and a sh- short, what did you just do? You know, a little pitch, like a little quick bio of the recent projects you shot or whatever's going on with you. But yeah, these are like, these are like bio letters with all these links. Yes. Yeah, Jonelle. You, how do each of you take submissions? That might be of interest. To <laughs> yeah, first. for sure. Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, so I like email submissions as we're talking about. So just sim- a simple submission with your headshot, a reel, a clip, and a, like two lines about you. It's good for me. Um, does everybody have their submission process on their website? I would think that would kind of be standard. Yes, we we do not yeah. we do not take email submissions. We we don't we don't take email submissions. It, you have to go to our website and submit. So it doesn't really allow. There is a place in there where you can top in some things, but it doesn't allow this long. What y'all are talking about these long bio <laughs> letters? It doesn't allow that. <laughs> um, so it, it, you, they do keep it very short and um, and simple. And there's a place to load a resume and, you know, a headshot and a video if you have it and stuff like that. So um, that saves us a lot of time, uh, you know, because we can see what they have first. Uh, now, if they want to write us a little something about themselves, I'm, I'm fine with that. But yeah, it doesn't allow these long letters. That's why I was wondering whenever people were saying they've got long letters, I was like, how do y'all get your submissions? So yeah, I mean, I think being, does everybody agree that being thoughtful of the agent's time when you're submitting is absolutely in the actor's best interest? Whether you're call, it sounds like Terrence like, likes for people to call him. We don't allow phone calls. Um, but again, this, the process for each agency is probably listed on their website. Go there first, do your research, know what you're getting into, um, and then follow whatever that agency's process is. If you follow the process, you're probably going to have the best results. If you don't follow the process, you are not going to have good results, I guarantee it. When people call our office and go on and on and keep me on the phone because they want representation, I ask their name. And I ask it because I know I'm not gonna work with them. So just keep that in mind. I like email submissions, but then I need to talk to a person. I, I just know me, my patience is like this. And I, 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 need, I can ascertain in the first five minutes of the conversation whether I'm gonna work with you or not. I mean, I just, I know who I need to work with because I worked one-on-one directly with my talent. I need to like them and they don't necessarily have to like me, but I need to like them. Okay. And if I don't like them, I'm not going to represent them. And so I just know, you know, within a five minute conversation, I'm like, oh, I'm not, you know, not going to represent you, you know? So I, I, I probably have a smaller roster than everybody else. I want a small roster of working people who are serious about this, who are not wasting my time, you know? Yeah, you you don't, uh, we can't waste time. I mean, it's like we turn down a lot of people and just because we, you can't take everybody, let's just be honest, but um, 
once you decide you like somebody just offer their materials and offer their, you know, what you see of them, then you invite them in for an appointment. And that's like, like you, I have to meet talent in person or, you know, by zoom or something, I have to see them in person and talk to them and uh, just figure out who they are. And uh, same thing with the Nashville office. Um, so we we're all the time seeing people in person instead of just saying, oh, you just want a list. Well, come on, on you know, come on board. So, yeah. Um, I would love to also, if you guys are down, talk about the difference between an agent and a manager. I find this is another area where actors are, are um, confused and um, not well educated. I know that <clears throat> in the Southeast, a lot of actors maybe don't have managers. Um, but it, I find that a lot of them expect the agent to do the management job and the agent job. Um, and so some lines tend to get blurred between their expectations of what we are going to do and our expectations of what our actual job uh, description is. So um, are you guys, uh, so for example, I know that managers are gonna help actors on a day-to-day -day basis. They're gonna help them with things like putting together their materials and uh, planning photo shoots and, um, you know, um, whatever they need personally, organization getting to set and things like that. These are all things that we can do as well, but they're not things that we are meant to do or at the top of our priority list. Whereas agents, we are negotiating contracts and we are um, doing pitches and we are, uh, you know, acting as an accountability resource to both the actor and the production. Um, so what what things have you guys experienced that we can help educate the actors on that they can expect from a manager if they have it or that they can expect from the agent um, and the differences there? Well, I actually, and maybe that's why I keep a small roster because I actually do perform both roles. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I work with new talent who come in with zero resume. I build them up and then they go off to you all, no offense, because you know, we live in the South where they think white is better. And quite often they go over to you all after I've done all the work, you know, because uh, I will sign people with zero experience and, and teach them and train them. And now, now all of a sudden they are grown me. They got to go over to somebody else. I mean, that, that has happened consistently in, my, in, in the industry. And, um, but I do do, I, I do photo sessions. I, I build their resumes. I get them started. I prefer them to acting classes because most of them don't have the experience in this market. This is not LA where you must keep the agent and the manager separate where there's a union for both, you know? And they, uh, so most of the people come to me don't have any training or knowledge and I have to train them and guide them. And so that's why I do keep a smaller roster because I do, I do both roles and then and I charge a commission based on both roles too, actually. You know, some people say, oh, his agent's commission is higher than talent trade. So I said, yeah, because I, I, I do multiple jobs. And no offense to talent trade. You know, that was just a, you know, I do multiple jobs. I am working as a manager <laughs> and an agent. Okay. I'm taking parents. Okay. <laughs> I said, this, you know, at this point, uh, you know, we, we've just been in the industry so long that we generally don't take people that don't have much experience um, because it is very time consuming uh, to that, to that end. And I agree with you when, you know, when we first started and for many years, we did that as well. You know, uh, we had to take people that didn't have a lot of experience and, and try to train them and try to do that kind of stuff. We're just now in a point that we can't do that. Um, so we, we have to turn out a lot of people because of that. Um, not saying that there probably couldn't be, you know, um, with some help, you know, a big star, I'm not saying that it's just that some of us just don't have time to do the manager agent job at the same time. So we don't do anything other than we, we like your guy that you have, we try to, uh, you know, mentor them into what they may need, you know, and what they should do. But after a long time of that, it's kind of like you kind of go, well, they're just not going to, you know, they're just not going to listen to you as an agent. They prefer to listen to everybody else rather than the agent, right? I mean, I think we've all experienced that. But, um, but we try to help them, you know, in organizing their materials, because that's only benefits us, you know, as well as the actor. Um, but other than that, I think, all you can do is tell them, you know, kind of your experience of, as to what they need, 
and should do. And it's up to them to listen or not to listen. I mean, it's not up to us to make them or force them to do anything. So it is, um, that's why they call it, you know, a business for the actor. You know, that's their end of the business, not our end of the business. But a manager, you know, they kind of control that career. I had a little boy that turned down a large role in a film here because his manager in L.A. thought it would not be beneficial for him, which it was a great little role. But his, you know, his manager turned it down for him. Oh. So a manager does that. <laughs> I don't think anybody in this, in this market in the Southeast needs a manager, in, in my opinion. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I just, to have a, a separate manager and you don't have anything to manage. I mean, you have no career. What, what, what are they managing? Lisa, what were you going to say? I think that's a really good point. It's a question I get a lot from actors. When do I need, do you think I need a manager? When do I need a manager? At what point do I need one? And I always say that too, you need one when you have something to manage. To manage. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah, I, most actors don't. Or yeah. when you're going to LA or, you know, if, yeah. you're, if you're moving to LA or, right. or, or New York. You, know, you have something to manage if you, you should have something to manage if you move to LA. <laughs> you know? Or not even just LA, when you have multiple agents, like in various markets, if you're working in multiple markets, so you have an agent in Chicago, you have an agent in New York, you have an agent in Atlanta, you have an agent in uh, LA, you know, if you have more than two agents in any different place, it's probably time for you to get a manager. But a lot of actors try to get a manager early, um, just because they don't really understand the difference between the two. Um, and I think that that's, that's interesting. Um, what other questions do you guys want to, want to talk about today? What can we Karen? When it's, when you talk about when it's time to move to uh, LA, you know, I've had a, or move out of this market. I have an actor that some of you all may remember. Anybody know Dave Chatham, David Chatham? Anybody remember Dave? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Dave started with me solely uh, as his first agent for nine years. And he just, He's been in LA maybe over 10 years now, but he started off with me and uh, then he tried other agents after nine years when his work started slowing up because I did my job so well. You know, he couldn't he couldn't land anything else in Nashville because he had so many conflicts. I mean, he did every insurance, direct insurance, state farm insurance. He was on the billboard for Farm Bureau Insurance. Then it came to the food conflicts. He had did Crystals, Captain D's, you know, uh, he just been... Then he came to auto. He had done Saturn and Nissan and Ford trucks. He had a conflict in every category. Where time again, uh, through me, he, had, he listed everything. It was a four-page resume. And then he was also, at the same time, doing theater and stage. And he did the movie 21 Grams with Sean Penn. And he was in The Last Castle. He had a speaking part in, uh, in both. Yeah, he had a line in both. You know, so, and, and a credit in both. So his resume had gotten so big that he just started, you know, conflicts, all the auto stuff he couldn't do. So he just, it started drop, dwindling off. He, he just outgrew this market, you know, and then he, he's like, okay, now I'm going to go to LA, you know? And so he's been out there, he's been on Star Trek and all that stuff. He's been doing well in LA, but he's been out there over 10 years, you know, right now I wouldn't say go to LA, but that's when it's time to go to another market. When you have exhausted this one, when you got a resume where you've done everything and all the major clients in this market and you've exhausted this market, yeah, now maybe it's time to move forward. But And he was definitely SAG eligible. He had been tapped hardly like nine times, you know. Yeah, and so he just got tapped hardly, tapped hardly. And, and so he was ready for L.A. I mean, he was SAG eligible and everything. A lot of people moved to L.A. and they don't even know what a tapped hardly is. They have, they're they not SAG eligible. And, my, and this may sound a little too direct, but I say it all the time. If you go to L.A., Without being SAG eligible, just say you want to be a porn star or a waiter. Same mm -hmm. difference. <laughs> because that's what happens. I mean, you know, no, don't want to be too too graphic, but why is the porn industry so prevalent in LA? Because all those pretty folks who went to LA thought they were going to be starlets with no credit. No credits. Well, have you um, encountered um, people from LA coming here not even knowing what Taft Hartley is? Oh, no. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they come here from LA not knowing these things, not knowing how the union works, not knowing that they cannot do non-union work because they all think that in a right to work state, 
they can do non-union work regardless. That's how they come here from LA. I've had several do that. And I'm like, no, that's not what that means. You, you know, if you're union, you're union. You've agreed with the union not to do non-union work. Even not, a, right no matter where you're located. Yeah. So, you know, even if you go out there, so, you know, even if you work out there and you come from there, it's, it's like all actors kind of don't, they don't, it's like they don't understand what Taft Hartley is, or they don't understand why, why you can't work non-union in a right to work state, even though you're a union. Can, can you guys explain that to those who don't know what that means, union, those who can't work for this and that, can you explain that to those that don't know? Because I don't know what that means. I've heard it, like I heard the strike, but what does that mean? Like, why are we on strike? You know what I mean? What's the the political? SAG is the, is the Screen Actors Guild, which is the union for actors. Uh, and you need to work in LA, which is a, a union state, you need to be a member of SAG. You know, Tennessee and Georgia are right to work states. You don't have to be a member to work here. But once you join the union, you're in the union all over the US, not just in. <laughs> in exactly. You know, you're, once you join in L.A., you, you can only do union jobs because you're a union actor wherever you go, you know. But if you're here as a non-union actor, you can't get tapped heartily into the union for the day to do a, uh, for, the, for that project. Is that, that's, is that too simplified? Or? Yeah. This tapped, heart, tapped heartily is just um, a ruling that was made back many, many years ago from a man named Taft and a man named Hartley and they were uh worked for the union for the um, railroad and they were telling them they couldn't get a job because they weren't unionized and they didn't want to join the union so they sued and it became a law that you that a company could not keep you from working uh if you were non-union on a union job so they named it the Taft Hartley bill and that's what Taft Hartley means so it just means that they can take you into the union, that one project, that one day, however long that role works, they can taft heartly you into the union, you're a union member and get all the benefits of the union member for that particular time. But then after it's over with, they drop you out of the union. That's all that means. And in a right to work, in right to work states, you can be taft heartly a lot, just like Terrence's guy, you know, he's taft heartly. I don't nine or ten times but in LA all you can be tapped hardly is three times and then you're a must join you have to join because it's a closed shop out there it's not here so um if you're tapped hardly a lot here and you move to LA you got to join so that's really kind of what that means but uh non-union members can work uh union jobs here uh, but they but union members cannot we're about to, we're, we're in the time frame for question and answers. Would you like to light up everybody who's a guest and join our, our uh, agents and pose questions to them? You'll, you'll want to unmute yourself, Diana. Who else is here? I think Myra. Myra was here. Let's see. Mora. Mora. Yeah. Hi, I, I do have a question. This is Maura. Hi. I put in the group chat about, um, can you discuss financial core with all of us, the pros and cons? That would be great. Thank you. Are you familiar with uh, the financial core? Uh, well, I am. Is anybody else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, we're all familiar with financial core. Yeah. Go ahead, Janelle. <laughs> um, well, I mean, financial core is just um, a way that a union actor supposedly it was created because if you move into a um, region that does not have a lot of union work and you're not supposed to work non-union uh, but you can't make a living because you've moved into this region that does not have a lot of union work we you know we until atlanta started all their projects and stuff down there i mean our our place here was like that you know uh, union actors would move here and they wouldn't have a lot of work to do. So um, actors could take financial core, which just means you're not a voting member. That's, a, that's really what it means. And you can not supposed to seek union work and you're not, and you don't, uh, but you're still paying dues, but you're not a voting member, but you can work non-union work. 
um, a lot of actors will ask if there's they can they should take financial core. And it's really not an agent's place to tell them that. That is their decision. Um, I just know that um, those who have um, worked non-union work, and I have, I have to say this with a, uh, to be politically correct. I mean, because I'm a union agent. I was raised by Teamster. I was a CWA shop steward. So I'm a long time union person. But um, this bit industry is so, so different. Uh, where the union's concerned that like we cannot force projects to be union and that's one of the things I really was hoping whenever we became union 30 years ago that we could do that but you can't uh, the, because number one the actors won't support that they they will not support not working <laughs> so um, so financial core you have to make that decision on your own when you're going to do it because you're not supposed to seek union work anymore and all of this it means you don't vote but you still pay dues so if you're willing to do all non-union work and not seek union work any longer then you know maybe it's an option for you if you're not getting the number of union jobs that you you know should get should be getting or uh, could get so if if but there's a lot of good non-union work so I, I think everybody has to look at what they're doing uh, same thing with joining the union I you know we try to tell actors well you know, look at the number of jobs you're doing and the number of union jobs you're doing. If you're not doing a lot of union work, then don't join the union at that time. You know, if you're, all your income is coming from non-union work at this point, do that. But if you're auditioning for union work and you're just not getting it, don't join until you start getting those jobs. So Financial Core is, um, it's a, it's a beast of its own, <laughs> just um, whether you should do it or not. And every actor's decision is not the same. So I think you have to talk it over with your agent and just decide, you know, where you're at in your career and what point uh, and what are you getting the most of if you're a union member. Sorry, anybody else got it? <laughs> yes. Janelle, I think you hit the nail on the head right there at the end. Talk it over with your agent and um, do your research. Uh -huh. Sorry, Lisa, I wasn't trying to talk on top of you. Just speak up on that topic. Kudos to you, Janelle. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I mean, with union members, it is a, it is a big deal whenever they move into an area that you're kind of, um, especially Knoxville. I mean, you guys, uh, well, we have an actual office, but my actors here is the ones I'm, thinking about um we're in this hole to where we don't do a lot of union work here at all at least you know nashville gets uh union commercials and some films and things like but you know east tennessee don't do that even memphis lisa you know y'all yeah. get union stuff there uh knoxville's just a different you know a different end of the state so um when our when union members move here um, that's a real question for them because all they're going to be doing is traveling, you know, and the non-union work here that we get, the good ones, the good non-union work we do get, you know, they can't do. So, you know, everybody has to decide where you're living, you know, and talk it over with the agent that's there in that market because that's, you know, that's how you got to decide. Can I also add that any of these questions that you're hearing, any of these topics that you're hearing us talk about, um, we are talking in generalities and we are talking about specific people that we have worked with. Just because we advised a certain person to do a certain thing doesn't mean that we're advising you to do it as well. Every actor is in a different situation um, and your agent is your, is your friend. Like we are the people who are vested in your best interest and we are going to want to lead you on a path to success because we're going to be a part of that, right? Um, so whatever your questions are that you asked here, gather the information, but know that it is a, a broad answer and go to your agent with that and ask about specifics. And also you. know the, the regional differences. Things that apply to LA are not always the same. Things that apply to the Southeast. People hear, people hear standards that are LA standards, and that is not the same as the Southeast, the market that you're in. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. And don't, you know, you can't listen to those 
I've had actors who have gone on sets with LA people and these LA yeah. people are telling them all this stuff and it doesn't apply here doesn't and apply back, here. back and say, well, what do you, you know? And we're like, no, listen to them. It doesn't apply here, you know? So you do have to do your research. It's like before I said, it's incumbent up on incumbent on actors to do the research and for your own careers, right? And then talk it over with your agents and get their opinions and, you know, uh, but research. I have a question. Uh, I have a question for you, you all. I'm just curious. What made you guys want to start an agency? Like something had to pique your interest when you were young. You didn't just join it just to join it. Like I'm curious. <laughs> um, Hit. <laughs> I, um, I uh, you know well I was in front of the camera before I became an agent so um I kind of knew the industry and knew what it was like but um I didn't really know the ins and outs of it to begin with and um I guess I look back now and say what did make me want to be an agent <laughs> I don't know um it was when I started there weren't many agents in anywhere so you know it was easier for me just because of that but um I, I we had a training center before we started our agency so we liked um you know we liked models and actors we liked seeing them benefit from what they were doing and and when they would you know get a part or a role with another agent we would just relish in that we would like enjoy it and stuff and so we just thought it would be great to for us to be the ones to tell them they got that role I guess and um that's really kind of started us down that path and um when we started casting our first career before we became a union agent it was always fun it was always fun dealing with agent uh, with actors and you know um sitting in that audition room with them and stuff and so um I think that we just enjoyed the industry and decided that was the path we were going uh, as an agent because it was the most fun for us to tell people they got roles and book them on roles. I have a question. And it's, it's, a, it's because I have a friend who's a producer, she's moving to Texas. And she's moving there because a lot of the films are being made, more and more films are being made there because the incentives in the state are really strong. And I'm wondering how you guys uh, interact with that, if you feed that market at all, or if you send people who want to go there to go there and find another agent. It's a you question. Give yourself tapes we can, uh, we can submit anywhere. Uh, yeah, uh, well, that's something I don't know. Was, you can say, OK, so you can send your folks over to Texas or out to Colorado or New Mexico or any of those places, Kentucky. Yeah. Definitely. They're willing to travel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a model on the show last night from Texas, too. <laughs> sure did, yeah. All right. I represent all over. Yeah. Well, we've got, it's, it's so much easier now with, you know, it's so much easier now with them, you know, being able to do their own videotapes and stuff. So as long go. as, and I'm sure, all of uh, all of us get you know breakdown so any anything you want to submit on it, i mean you're able to do it so um yeah but you know I, I am a believer in uh people needing agents in their markets so if they move there uh i suggest they get an agent there i don't i'm i'm not I, i've been asked to some you know rep people from la when they move there and i'm like no you know uh because i just i think you should have someone local helping you because they do know the ins and outs of the market themselves. So. Unless you're in a no market. And you're in, you know, you're in Utah. I don't need to find an uh, agent in Utah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but, and that's the question about getting started. I will tell you, I started as a fashion show producer. I was doing fashion shows all over town. And I was using models from Vanderbilt, from Fisk, from Tennessee State University. And it was actually some of the models that would tell me, and and I often tell people like, uh, I 
know that I'm directly responsible for helping grow the minority market in Nashville because I had people say to me, I went to an agency, they said they have two people of color, they got three people of color, there's not enough work in this town for people of color, and so I don't really, uh, I don't need any more, you know. I remember when, some of y'all might not be around long enough from the National Film and Video Association, when I went there and announced that I was open, I got bombarded with casting directors and uh, producers that were like, oh, you know, we send projects that are minority-based to Memphis, or to Atlanta, because we just don't have minority talent base here. So that's what made me start my agency, is to create a minority talent base. And um, and so one of the models when I was doing a fashion show was like, you know, there's not an agency specializing in minority talent. You should you should do that. And it was like a light bulb, it went off. And I was like, yeah, I want to do that. Because I when I say I produce a fashion show, I produce a fashion show. I write it, I script it, I light it. I go over it with the DJ, every song for every scene. It's a production. It takes a lot of work. And I realized sending a talent to a shoot and doing an invoice is a whole lot less work. <laughs> I was like, you know, I, I think I like that a little bit better because when I produce a fashion show, it's a lot of work. Oh, I, I forgot the part. Then I pick every outfit in the show. You know, so I, I pick every gown, every dress, every song, every you know, everything I produce the show. And so I'm like, no, nah, this becoming an agent and sending invoices is a whole lot easier of a job. So I thought now, long term, it's, it's, it's a lot of work too, you know, working with the models. But, you know, so that's how I got started. But yeah, definitely looking forward to trying to build a minority market here. And But now, of course, I represent everybody and love everybody. We're about to run out of time, but I was seeing that Diana had a question and I'd love for her to have a chance to ask it. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, for the agents on board today, are there specific um, traits or special skills that you're looking for for new talent submitting? Or how can new talent that are submitting to you be most helpful to you? Um, thank you all for already addressing the two, two sentence blurb. Very helpful. Thank you. Well, I can start with that. I mean, if I'm meeting you in person on Zoom, either one, I mean, one of the first things that I look for is confidence and ease. Confidence and ease. You know, just, um, and you, I see you have that already. So it's just nice to um, be able to right away tell that you're sure of yourself. And how does that happen? It happens through your training and something um, we talked about earlier, you know, hobbies, things that you can do to make yourself just feel good about yourself and being relaxed and knowledge of all your, of different skills. So I'm always looking for the resume that has, you know, a lot of different skills there, or at least, you know, some that you have, you know, not necessarily perfected or, but that you're really good at. Those things are important to me as well as your headshot and your reel. And it's like a complete package, right? When you come to us, the more you have, the better. If you already have a great headshot, a great couple of headshots, even better, and a great reel, whether it be short films or independent films or whatever you can get in the region. And again, confidence and ease. I, uh... Well, I want to I want to thank everybody for coming. We're, we're past 11, although we kind of got, we started early even a little bit, so. Uh, is there any, I'd like each of the, each of the agents to uh, do a little wrap up, thank you, or whatever it is you'd like to say to our guests and uh, to each other even, and then we will say goodbye. I'll just say, I was going to finish the question. I just like people who don't say they want to work, they really want to work. I look for talent that's, that really, oh, I want to be in this business, I, but I look at a resume, I mean, even when it comes to kids, I want to be in this business and um, how many school plays? How many church plays? Uh, I, I was born to be an actor. Yeah. How many school plays are, are you in? How many church plays? Oh, I've never been in a play before. Then how are you how are you born to be an actor? You 
if this is something that I look for a resume that says this is something you really want to do. It, it doesn't have to be professional work. It can be community theater. But I look for people who have shown me a track record. They're, they're working at this and they want to keep working to move forward. Not people who just say, I want to be in the business, but they're not putting in any work. I, I, okay. That's my wrap. Thank you. Um, I'll pick up Valerie from there. I um, just want to say thanks for being here, you guys. Thanks for sharing your questions in the chat. It was uh, great to be able to talk with Terrence and Janelle and Lisa um, about all these topics. And um, we wish you luck in, in your pursuits. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining. And it was great to see Lisa in person and Melinda and Terrence in person. We so don't, good to meet you, Janelle. We don't, we don't ever get to see each other either. I know. on the phone all the time. But, you know, we're like that with our actors most of the time. We see them one time and then, you know, the rest of the time it's e email or phone. So we do appreciate seeing you all in person sometimes. And thank you for coming out. And I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Women in Film and ActorCom and yes. everybody on the panel. I just enjoyed meeting everybody. And I was um, really impressed with just being able to talk with you guys, with the other agents ahead of time, because I think it's really important for us to work together and to be able to work together and chat from time to time, too. So I'm really appreciative of that today. And nice meeting everybody else on the panel. Good luck. Good luck to the actors. Yes. Yeah. Good luck, everybody. Well, thank you so much. We're, it was delightful. I think we learned a lot, and I appreciate everybody's coming and being a part of the, of the program for ActorCom. We have an afternoon with the casting directors, so that's another uh, nice. at 2 o'clock, so it'll be a good contrast with this. Thanks, everybody. I'll say goodbye and say, mm -hmm. go say goodbye, and we'll see each other next year maybe, huh? Thank, Thank you. you. Good. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.